Hey everyone, uh, I'm Trevor Fernandez Lenkevich, creator and writer of Area 51, The Helix Project, Minutes to Midnight, The Hour Between Life and Death, and the impending Rise comic. Uh, you can find me on social media, particularly on Twitter at Pocket Watch Press, Facebook and Instagram at Pocket Watch Press, and on Substack at pocketwatchpress.substack.com for the most uh, immediate and up to date news on what I'm doing, where I'm going, and sneak peeks at what I'm making. Uh, you can also check me out uh, on the interwebs at darknightnation.com slash PWP. And you, my friends, are listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a returning guest. You saw him, of course, with Area 51, Minutes to Midnight, and a bunch of other things I'm sure you talked about that I can't quite recall. But we are joined by the ever-talented Trevor Fernandez. Thank you, How are you doing today? I'm doing really well, Kurt. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you back because I always love seeing what you're doing because we had such a great conversation the last time around. I know you're always pushing yourself as a comic writer and pushing your envelope when it comes to your creative process. Well, we'll talk about that in this particular interview as we always do. But for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Yeah. So as a creative person, I'm someone who who never thought that they would be pursuing a creative career. I went to school for molecular biology and uh, kind of wound up with the uh, insatiable need to tell stories through comics specifically. Um, and so here we are, one pandemic and a couple years later, and uh, I'm, I'm making comics pretty much full time and just trying to really stretch myself, play in a certain parts of the the medium that that haven't really been exploited before and and just try to find new interesting ways to make comics shine and to make stories shine through comics so i have a really exciting new project called rise it's going to be hitting kickstarter on the 25th of october you know as as we were mentioning off camera i i never really thought i was going to be doing independent superheroes um i, I think the our industry comics is so saturated by superheroes because it was sort of the impetus behind everything. And so everybody wants to do them. And I never wanted to do it unless I felt like I could add something to the genre. I ended up putting myself together with a great team and the story just sort of fell in my lap. And what we're going to try to do is, is tell a really subversive drama through the lens of the superhero. And we're going to examine and maybe even deconstruct a little bit the male ego through the perfect man or the Superman. It's sort of about the way that the male ego has has become reliant upon um, a man's ability to perform in certain lights. And so I thought that was really interesting and what that says about um, where we find our strength and our, our ability to be strong. You know, I think that's such a constant priority you know, for, for men, it's just this idea of strength. And what does that even mean physically, mentally, emotionally? That how do we find strength when we assemble it through not superficial means, but means that have nothing to do with sort of our own inner sanctity. It's about what we're doing for other people and how we're looking in the eyes of other people. The, the male ego is often more reliant upon our perception of how we're seen by other people and not really about how we see ourselves. I just thought it was interesting to sort of explore that under the lens of, of a man who is kind of put in a position to perform on the highest level, whose capabilities bear upon him a, a certain responsibility. For him in particular, his his powers are, are reliant upon dopaminergic releases throughout the body. So basically the amount of dopamine in a system the short and sweet of it after I babbled for so long is essentially what would happen if uh, Superman had to feel good to do good. Oh, that, that's amazing. Like, when we talked about this earlier before we started the show, it, it was definitely an interesting take on, on this particular genre because the male ability to perform, or at least the term male as a whole when it comes to our own perceptions, has changed from decade to decade. Mm -hmm. um, it's It's had to evolve. It's had to step back it's had to push forward when it comes to our own emotional states and mental states more so recently than than anything and i think it comes back to even from a creative perspective like how do we actively showcase ourselves without showcasing ourselves because i think it's very mm -hmm. difficult for us to if we, if we put ourselves in front of a camera 
and we only show one side of ourselves. What side do we want to show? And is that really our true selves? And I think uh, what you're taking from your comic, especially with Thrice here, since we haven't mentioned the name of the comic yet, <laughs> is an amazing take on it. And I can't wait to read more about it for sure. Thank you. Yeah, we're um, we're really excited, and we've we've got a, a really really spectacular creative team um, just laying down the bones to make sure that we do this story the right way. Because it, in a topical sense, there's a bit of a tightrope, right? Like this isn't a, this isn't a an all out criticism of men, and it's also not like a carp launch like excuse as to why men can do awful things because anyone and everyone can. It's just sort of trying to unravel a level of context and explore you know the difficulty of the male role in society you know and, and just sort of try to navigate why men have a tough time doing the right thing for their own reasons as opposed to doing it because they they feel necessitated by society or um maybe even just coming to grips with who they are outside of what is traditionally masculine. And yeah, just try to do that in, in, in a somewhat nuanced way. Speaking of the team, because you have mentioned them a couple of times here, who is the team around you for this particular comic series? Because I think just pitching this idea to them must have been an interesting uh, see, seeing the reaction in regards to this. Yeah. Comic yeah, it definitely was. Uh, we've we've got a fantastic a fantastic crew of folks working on this book on the A cover and the interior pencils and inks. We have the incredible, wildly talented Ryan Best on colors. We have the absolutely brilliant Fabi Mar Marquez, and uh, on letters we have the amazing uh, Matias Zanetti. Got a, a solid international crew of folks taking their talents to this book, um, and yeah, the conversations around them were really interesting you know i mean ryan has been privy to this idea for yeah at least four months now you know that the seed of this idea actually really it came a while ago but I, once i started really honing in on what the story was really about at its core um it was actually around uh heroes con in charlotte and ryan and i were hanging out uh, after the show and uh, I couldn't think of a better person to team with for this project. He's got he's got a vitality to his style that while it's not realism, uh, it's expressive and it allows the characters to to act and exist and breathe within that two dimensional space and and hopefully have the reader feel immersed by that uh, that that sort of humanity that he brings to the project. And at the end of the day, this is this is a drama. This story and and. At its core, it's about these characters and what they're going through. He was the perfect partner in crime for this project. So then what was the piece of artwork you got back when once you started collaborating together that was just just blew your mind when it came to the concept you originally had written down versus what he brought to the table? Honestly, it was it was just the the character designs. You know, I've I've never gotten so excited about character designs before. And it's funny, as much as I've sort of eschewed the typical like comic book creator working in superheroes, there was something incredibly exciting about seeing a superhero that I was creating come to life and, and seeing all the iterations of the costume and just like the, the characters' expressions and, and really, really beginning to develop those things was a, a massive excitement in a way that like, I don't know if I had ever felt before when going through sort of the initial stages of the character design. And there's something really cool between Ryan's innate style and like the looseness of those drawings that made the character feel so alive. And that that sort of struck with me. Like one of my favorite things, uh, one of my favorite pieces of developmental art to come out of it so far was actually once we nailed down the character design, he did sort of a, a fully rendered but like loose drawing of um, the protagonist in his, in his hero costume and in his civvies. And that is still one of my favorite things to come out of the project whether it be the actual finished interior art or the cover art i don't know there's something so it's got like a life of its own that drawing in my head and and really really interesting to admit because we've got a lot of really great covers and some really beautiful artwork throughout but there's something about that piece that really stuck with me is it going to be a poster or anything like that yeah that would 
would be a fun stretch goal poster or something like that. Maybe, maybe if uh, if we if we go beyond the initial funding goal in the Kickstarter, we'll do some type of mini print with like the original character designs or something. That might be really cool. Or just make it a digital option, and that way you're not printing anything. That's true. That's true. Sometimes people people love to be able to touch stuff. So <laughs> we'll see where I can incentivize um, a little and galvanize a little support for the campaign. I figured if it's something that you like, then I'm sure other people may enjoy it as well too. So it's just something extra to to tie to tie everything up. True, that's very true. It's a good idea. Looking at the writing of this particular series, and and it's a very deep topic as well too. But I'm sure it's very personal as well. When you first started writing this this comic series itself, and you started to actually look at yourself personally as well too, I'm because I'm sure as a writer, you're obviously putting yourself into your stories subconsciously or consciously. What did you work through and how did it help you once you finished this particular comic series? Because I'm sure it's difficult to talk about, especially on Mm -hmm. the podcast at that, but how did it help you in some way, shape or form, or did it help you? I think just the act of exploring it is kind of a help. I mean, I went into the pandemic in my early twenties and I came out in my mid twenties. And so there were some, some pivotal, there's some pivotal time lost there. And, and I think developing my understanding of myself as a man and who I want to be and what I want to be. And I think, frankly, if anything, I was deprived of the experience to make mistakes uh, or to make as many mistakes, you know, that, that sort of period of your life is for the experimentation and going out and being dumb and, and learning from mistakes. And there's a part of me that, that feels like with the pandemic, I sort of lost the opportunity to, you know, F around and find out. It, it just sort of jumped right into having a profession and um, working and, you know, paying bills and, and just, you know, being in the thick of it. So there's a part of me that's like, I didn't really get that pivotal time to figure out the the type of man I did not want to be by living. And it's all been anecdotal. And so I I kind of wanted to explore even my own understanding of what it means to be a man and and figure out the type of man that I want to grow into uh, through this story and introduce a character who, while well-intentioned and um, and at the end of the day, a decent man, uh, is making some pretty major mistakes because of his his inability to reconcile with his own masculinity. So it's sort of taking what I feel like I had lacked and 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 expanding that onto the grand scale of what is effectively an American god, sort of figuring out what story there is to be woven from there. Pardon me, uh, the quote I'm going to pull, but are you a god? No. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, Ray! You're always supposed to say yes. <laughs> Ghostbusters. Sorry, I just watched it recently it's, uh, as well. Uh, what better time to watch Ghostbusters yeah, than the late October? Exactly. You got got to rewatch the classics. You know? I rewatched, or I just watched The Shining and mm-hmm. uh, The Thing for the first time. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, The Shining. Now, now that that was something I watched early on in in my when I started getting into films and all that stuff. I watched The Shining, and it scared the living hell out of me. Like it was, it was really? one of the, oh yeah, it, come on, elevator full of blood, the two freaky twins. I mean, Jack Nicholson being himself. I mean, it was pretty much a portrayal of himself in Hollywood. If you look at the behind the scenes of that particular series for what Kubrick accomplished, it was mm-hmm. rather amazing for the limited budget he particularly had for it. But yeah, from from an acting standpoint, it was just it was very like very gorilla, very shoestring um, budget mm. style. So. It's it's a it's a it's a strange it's a strange movie that that really lays on um, a couple Kubrick isms and uh, it's funny that I think the most petrifying part of that film was the the sound that Danny's little tricycle made as it was rolling around the hotel. The really the the sound design stuck out for me a lot in that film, um, and the that sort of slow churning. Uh, sound from from the wheels on Danny's tricycle as he's exploring um, the hotel and and we're following him through these like really steady, almost like I don't want to say monotone because that implies uh, sound, but it, the the visuals were almost akin to something that was monotone. These tracking shots as he's going through the 
in the inn yeah, yeah. The, 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 especially in the hallways there how everything was just so uniform everything was so consistent and it was just like <laughs> the visual storytelling is, is something yeah especially in film that that once you get a, accomplished a, a great shot with actors or without actors for that matter sometimes you're establishing shot especially that opening for that particular scene taking a helicopter and going through the mountains following a single car for five minutes just for the credits to roll it's just like where are we going? What is this leading up to? You know, it's just amazing to see what they've accomplished. So then what's the opening scene for, for Rise then that just will really sink people into the story? The opening scene for Rise is, is funny. There's, there's a cheekiness to it. It's also um, begins to acknowledge more of the core conceits of the story in that the the male ego is very often reliant upon a man's sexual health or their relationship or their their perception of their sexual health. And so the protagonist just meeting a woman at a bar before he goes out to he's he's not aware of it, but this is gonna be the day that he sort of exposes himself as a as a superhero on the streets of New York City. And so it's him sort of courting a woman at a bar just before a, a cry for help sends him into his first public uh sort of rescue and uh the rest of the story really hits the ground running from there. So is this a, a single issue? Or is this going to be a series? Like, what is your ultimate game plan for, for Rise? Yeah, so there's going to be about 100 pages worth of story, three slightly um, oversized issues. This first issue, we're looking at about 32 pages. And what we're really excited about after speaking with my printer is that um, we're going to be bringing back the triple page spread for this first issue. So uh, there's going to be a really cool fold out page in a, in a, in a pivotal moment of the story where uh ryan is just drawing the hell out of a massive uh massive spread tease away i mean if that doesn't draw people's interest i don't know what will like that. yeah funny. We were super excited. I was I was in um I was in New York a couple of weeks ago on a little business trip. I was thinking to myself, I called Ryan and I was just like uh, are you going to hate me? He's like, why? It's like I, I had this idea and I haven't talked to my printer yet. Uh, to see if it's possible, but what if we did a triple page spread? He's like, "What do you mean?" I was like, uh, "I mean, like a fold out. Like we we have a page so big that it's it's sort of there's a word starts with a C, corrugated maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, it cor the, the way the page is corrugated, you just fold it out." And he's like, "I would be willing to draw that." And so the question then became, okay, "How can I edit the script to to make sure the pacing lines up?" and can I uh, get my printer to agree to do something like that? And after getting all of the proper confirmation, we are in good shape. So, yeah, we get to bring back the triple page spread, which I'm super stoked to do. I was going to ask, what was the last triple page spread that you got to to read? I don't remember. I feel like it, the only, the last one I remember might have been in like Jeff Johns Green Lantern, mm. um, or maybe the Peter Tomasi Green Lantern core around that around that time but it was that that time period um i don't i can't think of anything in recent years where i've seen a solid spread if you get to good pacing in a comic series and you get like the at the bifold of the actual comic and you get that nice two-page spread in that respect then sometimes that's like a really cool way to get into the second half of the story but yeah yeah i'm super super excited i mean it, it's been a the prospect of, of organizing things with the printer has been um uh, an interesting time but i think we finally nailed something down and uh because we get one i was like well why are we gonna why why waste the space we're, we're working out in a way where there are two triple page spreads back to back okay. to really really take advantage of that one fold out page yeah we're gonna get to do do some really really cool stuff i mean there there were these two moments in the script that as i was editing i was like i, I could only envision them as these big vertical triple page spreads and uh i'm really really glad that we were able to put that together can you tease about what kind of happening at the beginning of it so that we don't quite give it away like because this sounds just too exciting not to share at least in some way shape or form yeah so it's it's a major moment in the story where the protagonist is put in a fairly depowered position because as i mentioned before his, his powers are contingent upon um the available free dopamine in his body. And so there's something that happens where he's kind of put in a pretty emotionally volatile state and is just shy of being depowered. I mean, he's he's not quite super. He decides to to go save a woman from a, a burning building anyway. 
and it's it puts them in a very compromised situation and and we have this really cool um really really cool layout of the page where he's sort of bearing the weight of the building and that the that's the larger image but the panels leading to it are within the rubble so the panels are shaped in the, to be within the rubble that is being uh bared by the protagonist uh in the larger image at the bottom of the page so it has the size of a full triple page splash but the panels are inset within uh the sort of construction debris that uh he's he's sort of wear, bearing on his shoulders and then the next page is sort of him triumphing over that and finding strength in in the moment and uh I think uh, it's it's going to be really really beautiful to see how that is is fully rendered. It sounds amazing, really does. Like I mean, the the creative use of the panel, I think, is something that not a lot of people do. Or it takes a special artist to kind of vision what the script has. So I'm glad that that Ryan is doing this. How you're describing it just sounds incredible. Like I, I'm excited just to see it. Like I really want to see it. <laughs> We're super stoked. I mean, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm super fortunate to have uh, a creative partner like Ryan who. Um, is an intuitive storyteller you know there is no there's no hand holding there's never any um struggle to to get the, the sort of base communication of the story off with us it's always how do we push it to the next level how do we elevate what we're communicating because we're never squabbling over the basics and that's that's a really beautiful thing like when we were um when we first kind of began working on the art a little over a month ago uh, in Baltimore, we were beginning to have conversation about the way we were rendering touch because part of this story is sort of about a, a man's perception of of his sex life. I really wanted to be deliberate about the way that we were showing touch and how that was being communicated visually and sort of like the subtlety of a finger depressing a, a piece of skin, you know, and what that's going to mean in the story and and sort of how we can really humanize those moments without words um, in the best way possible and just leave it to the the character acting and the um, the shot selection for the panels. That was a, a really interesting and I don't know, some people might find it nothing but semantics, but uh, fortunately, like I said with Ryan, we're not needing to really concern ourselves with the overarching picture because we're locked in there. We can really get into that nitty gritty and maybe play around with things that people aren't going to notice, but will contribute to their overall reading experience in a big way. How's the the color palette for this particular series? Are we going with warm colors, cool colors? Like what is the, your, your visual concept when it comes to, to this particular series, at least in this first issue that we're going to see? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, part of it we was we were really inspired and, and this obviously part of the the, a major part of the conversation was her colorist Fabi. Um, we were really inspired by like what Adriana Lucas has been doing over at DC, where there is like this brightness and warmth and contrast. But um, we want to be able to pull that in, in in emotional moments. But yeah, I feel like Adriana Lucas is is setting the tone to be one of the, the best uh, superhero colorists of the current generation. And I don't think en enough people are sort of catching on that wave from from what he's putting out. And so, yeah, we, we we're doing our best to translate some of that same energy to the color palette of our eyes, for sure. He uses a lot of really bright colors that are variations on the base tones that um a an offset printer will use to produce color so when you print offset there are four colors that are used to uh th th that are mixed together in, in various proportions to create a a wider range of colors uh for for your project but the base colors are cyan yellow magenta and black and so when you use those colors in any sort of natural state they come out really vibrant, really saturated. And Adriana Lucas will more often than not pepper in a lot of those colors as substitutions for what you might think of as like a traditional tone. So like if you're looking at um, a sunset, for example, you're going to have sort of a, like a bright burnt orange and yellows and, and such, but like Adriana might use um, a, a rich magenta, you know, a nice bright magenta in there. And it adds like 
not only this cool bit of visual contrast, but it, it also plays to the physical printed product, you know, and how the printer is going to be able to translate that into an almost one-to-one -one form. Because, you know, you, once you get into like comics pre-production, there's always an understanding that the physical print will look different from what you're seeing on the page, because what you're seeing on a computer is registered in RGB or light, essentially. Their, their color's made out of light. Whereas when you go to the physical printed item, CMYK, their prod, uh, their colors that are comprised of four base colors. And so, yeah, Adriano just kind of peppers in some of those, those base, those base printer colors, I guess we'll call them in sort of not necessarily, I guess, unexpected places, but they work, you know, they compositionally work. I think it, it adds like a, it just, it adds like a real sense of style to the project and and like i said will ultimately translate super well um between the screen to the page it also saves you from literally having to reformat every single page as well too <laughs> to a degree yeah i mean there's there's always converting um the file to cmyk but um it, it definitely lessens the anxiety of feeling like i'm gonna open the uh I'm going to open the book when it hits my my doorstep on a on a massive pallet and then uh, be sad because something really did not go the way we were hoping it would. And that is a, a huge stressor to take off the shoulders of an independent comic book creator. I'll tell you that it sounds so stupid and, and so specific, but it it is huge. No, it doesn't sound silly at all because it's it's what you're paying for as well, too. That's the other thing. It's like you're putting money into your product. You want your product to be the best it possibly can be, especially mm -hmm. with the amazing team you have around you. So why wouldn't you want it to be perfect right off the bat? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and that there's nothing more daunting than looking at a palette of an, of like 2,500 comics <laughs> and thinking, oh, you all have this same mistake. Like that sucks. <laughs> So yeah, it's, it's definitely, it eases a little bit of stress off the shoulders when it comes to the the final print. Absolutely. And yeah, it, it also just, it adds to the atmosphere. You know, there's something about the use of those colors and the way that Adriano does it by like sort of shifting the cyans, the yellows, the magentas into like a, like a hotter, brighter, more saturated version of those base colors. Um, it just, it adds something I don't, I can't, it's hard to explain. It just, it accentuates the interior art in a big way. And I, and the thing that comes most to mind is like Adriana Lucas coloring over Bruno Redondo in Nightwing right now. And while Ryan might have a different style, some of the way that Ryan creates form and the way that guys like Bruno Redondo create form are similar. And so I, I felt like having a, a sort of similar approach to coloring Ryan as to, how Redondo is being colored on Nightwing would really, really lend well to the story and um, would lend to the overall visual composure of the book. What type of perks do you have for this particular campaign that's currently ongoing? We're doing a lot of fun stuff, some some pretty typical rewards, along with some stuff that I'd never been able to offer before. On launch, definitely get toward the campaign as soon as you can, because we're going to have a plethora of early bird discounts, some of which are going to be in pretty limited quantity, both in terms of the time. So I think we're going to have it for about 48 hours, but there's also going to be a, a quantity limit as well. But outside of that, we, for the first time, will have pages of original art available on a Kickstarter. So you'll be able to get one of the first two pages of the of this first issue it's as a piece of original art hand inked so that's really exciting i've never been able to do something like that before and uh, we're going to have a couple of options for people to get commissions from ryan at different sizes to uh, placate you know different price points and what people can manage so we're going to have options available for a five by seven sketch card a nine by twelve uh, piece or an eleven by seventeen piece i mean like frankly i i found ryan because of how beautiful his commissions were on a show floor. So I'm really, really excited to be able to bring that to Kickstarter and let people take home a piece of custom art. And uh, he's been incredibly gracious, gracious and generous to offer that service to the campaign. From that, you can get drawn into the book, which is always incredibly exciting. And we've got options for uh, people to become 
official producers of the book, executive producers of the book. Your name will be immortalized inside and, and credited, along with a, a slew of different fun rewards that come with that, including a custom rise commission, so a commission of one of the characters in the cast of the book. We're doing our best to bring a, a different experience to the Kickstarter pledge reward system that I'm, I've gotten to do before because Ryan is fortunately one of those talents who can uh, operate digitally, traditionally, you name it. So we're definitely trying to take advantage of that, put some some really cool traditional art in the hands of the people that support this book, which seems to be fleeting. You don't, you don't really get to see that so much anymore. And especially not at like an affordable price, you know, nowadays you, you get like a bust for 200 bucks. Ryan's going to do a bust for you for like, I think like 80 bucks. Yeah. He's, he's incredibly, he undervalues his work on, on a ridiculous level. And so while I've been spending the last year and a half telling him that he, he's worth more than he charges people, I guess might as well take advantage of that and get some really cool art for a more than fair price. But aside from that, you know, we're going to have variant covers. We've got four really, really gorgeous covers that are all interestingly like these sort of character with very few props representing different elements of the story. So the A cover by Ryan is a bit of an homage to a um, Francis Manipal Dark Side War one shot from like six or seven years ago and then we have sort of different takes different looks on this character rendered by an international host of talent so you have steph c doing our b cover which you'll see um in the sort of lower third it's it's the green piece there it adds elements of of sort of abstraction to kind of delve into one of this character's key flaws and and one of the the things that he's going to learn, going to need to learn to reconcile most if he wants to be a, a, a better man and a better hero. And then the third cover by Raymond Lee is like, I mean, it's it's almost it's it's almost Jim Lee esque. Uh, it is angelic and statuesque, and it's the protagonist holding a woman um, in the sort of rubble of a burning building. But the it's really really beautiful. The the flames sort of evoke the the abstract image of angels wings mm -hmm. behind the protagonist and you have uh hands coming out of the smoke of all all the people lifting him up and then finally we we've got one of the the biggest cover artists in comics right now ivan tau gracing us with this bright poppy beautiful cover of uh, the rise character sort of hoisting the greek symbol for change uh, a delta symbol and then sort of it's a little bit more on the nose here but you know we're very much going to be uh, transforming this character and, and really pushing change at, at a really uncomfortable level. Uh, and, and we felt like that was a great way to encapsulate it. So four gorgeous covers available. Um, we've got bundles if folks find themselves wanting to go home with all of them. I'm trying to think, man, what else do we have on this campaign? We've got prints. We've got a couple t-shirts. We've got uh, opportunities for folks to catch up on my back catalog if anybody is interested in uh, some really cool sci-fi thriller adventures or supernatural detective mysteries or what have you. You know, I've been really fortunate to have gotten to play in quite a few genres prior to doing Rise. And so, you know, if anybody's interested in seeing how my voice applies to those different settings, uh, we will have Area 51, the Helix Project available, along with Minutes to Midnight, The Hour Between Life and Death, which has four different short stories in there in this one massive 64 page package you know it's trying to have a, a little bit for everybody on this thing hey i mean the more content that you can give people for their money especially in today's society and in today's economic terms as it is the better it is for all people because you're, you're sharing stories you're sharing amazing comics you're sharing yourself as a creative person as well as the talented teams around you for your various projects that you've done. The more eyes on these people and yourself, the better. And if you can do that on, say, a show like this, or you can do that in your campaigns, then, hey, all the more power to you, and maybe you'll be the next person writing for Marvel, DC, or Image, or whoever down the road, as long as you still do your independent stuff as well. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's that's always going to be in my DNA, is, is being able to tell stories that come straight from the soul that are not impacted by... Uh, the whims of larger entities trying to sell products, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it would be a dream to be able to play in the sandbox of, of the uh, iconic tapestry of American gods, but there's something really pure about being able to tell stories uh, in, in such a, 
pure fashion, you know, independently. I feel like I'm being redundant by reusing that word, but that's really what it is. Independent storytelling is pure. It's un unapologetic and it, it speaks more to the creator's voice than anything else and, and sort of the things that are either troubling them or the world concerning them or, or just sort of generally occupying their bandwidth. And I think there's a little bit more of a runway there to have that translated you know, in, in a, a little bit more of an authentic and organic fashion than there is to, you know, having to make sure that you are being the, the gatekeeper to this, the, the legacy of, of this massive of an icon. Yeah. So there's, there's merits to both. And, and no matter where I am, what I'm doing, the one thing I can always promise is that I will be telling stories for myself and in a fashion like independent comics that will have the closest one-to-one -one translation of what's in my head. And it's freeing too. You get to be as creative as you want or as less creative as you want. As long as you can put your stories out, that's the main thing and keep doing what you're doing because you have great stories. You have a, a great concept overall too. I can't wait to see what you're doing next when it comes to whatever else you have, you know, in your creative repertoire. You're always welcome back on the show as always. And, you know, I can't wait to see what you do next. Oh, Kurt, thank you so much, man. It's a, it's a privilege to hear that. It's a privilege to be here and, you know, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to tell stories and, and have the, the platform to um, to lift them up and to talk about them. And without folks like you, uh, we don't get to do that, man. So thank you seriously so much. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is this particular Kickstarter campaign or where can we find all of your creative and talented works that you have? Yeah. So um, as I mentioned, you can pick up any of my previous work on the Kickstarter campaign. So you get to kind of Kill two birds with one stone and support the current project while also getting in on, on the past work. But that will be available on the Rise Kickstarter page, which um, you should be able to type in Rise Comic Kickstarter and that'll pop up. But if not, you can channel through any one of my social media from which there are links in the bio that lead directly to the campaign. So uh, if you check me out on the app from, formerly known as Twitter, it's going to be at pwatchpress, um, on Facebook and Instagram at pocketwatchpress, on, uh, let's see, what are all the social medias nowadays? There's so many. Uh, I'm on blue sky at TFL rights. So just the first initial of each of my names, rights. And uh, you can check me out on uh uh, pocketwatchpress.substack.com for the most intimate news uh, and and all things relating to me and my career, what I'm doing, where I'm going, and uh, get some early sneak peeks at some artwork before they come out to the public, uh, along with opportunities to uh, become present for some seasonal giveaways. So um, yeah, you'll be able to click the link in my bio through any one of those socials to a link tree, which will lead you to pretty much everything I have to offer, but most importantly, to this campaign, which ends, I believe, November 27th. So there's, there's where the ticking time clock hits zero. Well, Trevor, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word T-W-O, not the number two. Of course, you can find this on our podcast, which is a podcast of her which is twogeekstalking.podbean.com. The YouTube channel is a lot more updated than either of those because I am only one person. It's www.youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.